Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters. In today's episode, we are going to be discussing David Rosenberg's argument that deflation remains the largest risk facing the world economy. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Keith, what are we going to talk about? Thank you, Richard. Great. Okay, so last week I was listening to Macro Voices and they had on David Rosenberg who had a long presentation arguing that inflation fears were overdone and deflation remained the world's biggest problem or biggest risk. Now, regular viewers to uh, Portfolio Matters will know that we disagree with that and we think inflation is a growing risk going forward, but it's very important to listen to people who disagree with you and therefore we're going to go through his arguments and there's a long presentation his uh, slide deck ran to uh, some well over 100 slides so we've cut it down but we are going to go through this so you understand his argument okay so first of all he is saying that how currently household income in the us is heavily dependent on stimulus checks with the implication that as soon as those stimulus checks end, household income will decline. Mm -hmm. So 17 million Americans are still on a benefit program of some kind. Um, and as a result, every other recession in US history has seen a decline in household income apart from the last one where household income stayed up on the back of stimulus checks. Yeah. And during the year, people obviously couldn't spend on services because they were in lockdown. So what they spent was on durable goods and his question is, how much of that is just brought forward consumption? So it's brought forward refurbishments that they were intending to do in the future, and now they've done it. So will there be a collapse in durable, durable good spending mm. when people can spend on other things? And you see very strong spending on um, durable goods. Although... I would say, looking at this, that is not really out of line. I mean, there is a has been an increase, but it's not dramatic. Um, so how many times can you remodel your home? There's um, residential improvements, obviously big spending during 2020 on tools and garden equipment. Again, very high expenditure. Um, furniture expenditure shot up and carpets and flooring. Now, you're not going to replace your carpet that often. The other point he makes is that there was a lot of spending on luxury goods, so boats and planes and jewellery. Mm -hmm. So is that sustainable? Will that collapse again once the market opens up again? Yeah. Now, some things are not coming back. Non-residential construction and... You know, one of the side effects of the um, lockdowns and everyone working from home is that businesses have discovered that they can work from home. And I think there's going to be structurally less demand for office space going forward. So this could well remain subdued going forward, which would be a drag on growth. And obviously, the whole travel sector is depressed. 
And actually, the um, growth forecasts are for growth to return to essentially normal levels by later this year. So we're seeing a big surge in growth now, but the uh, consensus, the Fed consensus, is that we will return to historic norms quite quickly. And if we return to historic norms, then why should we expect more inflation than there was pre-COVID? Mm. Now, one thing that has absolutely shot up in the last few months is commodity prices. But he points out there is a weak link between commodity prices and inflation. Although Richard has um, something to say on that. Well, I, I would say one of the fears that um, uh, third world countries and um, one of the things that was a cause of the Arab Spring was inflation caused by food price inflation. And um, to say that commodity prices have no no link with inflation is simply not true. Um, and food price inflation for, in China, for example, is a huge issue for the government. So I think you, this is a little bit like, um, it's a one size fit all, fits all statement. And um, the, I mean, you know, one of my issues, and there are more graphs to come, but it's relevant to say at this point, one of my issues with this analysis by uh, David Rosenberg is that he, it is, um, and as Keith has said, it's, it's a backward looking analysis. And um, you know, economies are complex systems and they have discontinuities. And you can't spot a discontinuity by looking backwards. So the, um, my concern is that we have, we are doing so much to the economy that we don't understand that it's very easy for discontinuities to be, to evolve, to, to occur. And this backward looking analysis simply fails to see them. Um, and um, let's let Keith carry on now through the, the remainder of the charts, but we can come back to that uh, towards the end. Sure. Just to go back to uh, Richard's point about um, the link between commodity prices and inflation. Actually, I have just listened to a podcast specifically about the link between food price inflation and inflation. And it was claiming a link, a strong link between rising food prices and rising wage demands leading to inflation. Yeah. So I think putting everything in these commodity price index disguises a lot of possible relationships because we know the commodity price index is dominated by oil. Also, about we, 30 or 40 percent. Yeah. And also, Keith, the, uh, the US CPI, core CPI, excludes food and energy costs because they are deemed to be volatile. But if you're earning you know, $40,000 a year and you have to drive to work and you're feeding your family of three children, um, food and energy prices are hugely significant to your own personal experience. So it, it's, it is a sort of, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of like a futile comparison almost, because it's, it's not acknowledging the fact that the index isn't representative of what a large proportion of the population actually experiences. Mm. Well, core CPI, yeah, by definition excludes food and energy. You're absolutely right. So he's sort of saying, well, so CPI, core CPI isn't affected by changes in commodity prices. As you point out, um, commodity prices are, um, en energy is a, is a very volatile commodity. It's not included in core CPI and food isn't. So it's like, well, what are yeah. you hearing here? Well, but to be fair to David Rosenberg, which what he's saying is that the changes in commodity prices don't lead through to wage inflation leading to general inflation. Now, we, in this discussion, we are pushing back on that, saying maybe that yeah. is true for energy and copper. But, you know, I would like to see these, this uh, relationship done just with the food index. Yeah. For example. yeah. And the heading, don't be fooled, commodities actually have no correlation with inflation. Well, I, I simply say that that is wrong and you need to analyze that in much more detail to understand what yes. the actual situation is. 
Yes, well, what we're saying is actually the uh, inflation that matters to, to consumers is not necessarily called CPI, it's CPI. Yes. Um, now, he goes on that there can be no commodity super cycle without China because, and China's um, credit impulse is now fading and industrial production growth is declining. Although, you know, frankly, it's declining from a huge peak to very high. Yeah. And the denominator matters at this point. You know, China growing only 15% when it's now the largest economy in the world, or very yeah. close to, that is enormous. And the, um, the OECD's China leading economic indicator, I mean, it looks like it's at around about four or five yeah. on that scale on the, on the left-hand side, Keith, and which is the highest it's been currently for the last decade. Yes, exactly. But also, it, I think, again, it depends what commodity. You know, in the case of um, copper, if the whole world is now going green and there's all this fiscal stimulus and guided investment yeah. into green technology, which is very copper intensive, then you don't really need China to grow its copper um, demand. In fact, it'd be better if they didn't, because the West is demand for copper is enough to um, use up all spare capacity anyway. And we also have the issue of, of what's going on with, with commodity supply. And uh, we know from various Portfolio Matters podcasts that we've done that uh, even a, a, a relatively low increase in demand can't be currently met by available supply in, in many, many commodities. Yeah. Um, unemployment remains elevated. And if unemployment remains elevated, then wage growth should remain subdued and therefore inflation should remain subdued and so my my pushback against that Keith, is that um the uh the bargaining position of, of any particular category of worker depends on the the supply of their skill and mm -hmm. um so you can't equate the level in, of employment directly to wage inflation without understanding the sector you're looking at and the us is a highly service um, oriented economy and um, increasingly so as as manufacturing I think is still being offshored um, so I think you have to be very careful that saying that just because you have a pool of unemployed people you you therefore have no pressure on wage rates I agree and we know from the weeklies that US manufacturers are reporting key skill sh shortages yeah, and I was listening to a podcast today where the um, uh, they were commenting that there is a shortage of lorry drivers, and um, they uh, which is pushing pushing up. Uh, not only is it pushing up drivers' wages, but it's pushing up transport costs within the U.S. Yes. So this chart shows that currently wage pressures are subdued. Now, the one thing I would say about this chart is we know that unemployment is very elevated and yet yeah. wage pressures are normal. Yeah. So, you know, shouldn't wage pressures be down at zero at this point, according to his argument? Yes, they should. That's a good point, Keith. Um, and that's external corroboration of that. I looked up the data and, um, you know, wage growth is um, low and only 4% of small businesses cite inflation as a top concern. Although, you know, frankly, if I was a small business at this point, I'd be citing COVID regulation as number one, you know, so it's, this is not that they're not necessarily concerned about inflation. It's just saying that it's not their top concern. I mean, basically it hasn't been a concern for them apart from in 2008, when actually, yeah. ironically, I don't think we had much inflation, but we had a lot of QE. Yeah. Um, it hasn't been of much concern to them since 19, effectively, since this graph was, was initiated. So I, I, but if you let, take the baseline as being two or 1.5 or something, yeah. we're at four. So uh, this, this is one of these charts. This is, this is one of the dodgy gold charts, Keith, only it's, um, it's yeah, well, I completely yeah. agree with you, Richard. I, I think this is manipulative. Share reporting inflation as single most important problem. 
Yeah. You know, not as, you know, if it was, I'd be more interested if it said percentage reporting inflation as a problem. Exactly. Yep. Okay, so this all adds up to the view that in in David Rosenberg's opinion, inflationary pressures will be transient. And as evidence of that, the bond market currently appears to be agreeing with him. Mm -hmm. So in the last month or so, bond prices have peaked and they're coming down as though the inflationary impulse has peaked itself and the markets are coming to the view that inflation will indeed be transitory and money for the money supply uh velocity of money has plummeted this is absolutely true and you will remember the um monetary equation is price times quantity equals money times velocity and we know money has increased by a third over the last 18 months and therefore in order for there to be no inflation the velocity of money has to have also collapsed by a third and it has pretty much done so mm. however we know they're continuing to print money and so in order for you not to get inflation you now need the velocity of money to keep on drifting lower which to be fair it has been doing so for a lot of the last 15 years yeah but you know certainly post gfc the but, banks were all in um, their balance sheets were damaged so that's yeah. what you expect. The other thing I'd say about this graph, Keith, is that um, there is only one way of calculating velocity of money because it isn't something you can directly measure. And you calculate it from the formula V equals PQ over M. I know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's re entirely retrospective. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, bank lending remains depressed. But of course it has been depressed. I mean, you know, who's going to be lending money in the midst of a government-induced, mandated recession in which no co companies can't earn any revenue? Yeah. You know, yeah. I fully expect bank lending to start up again. Um, I mean, bank lending to households still contracting. But again, you know, when people are on uh, furlough, etc., who's going to be lending to them? So actually, if you look at the graph, Keith, you can see that the rate of bank lending is still contracting, but at a lower, at a significantly lower rate in the last month or so. Great. And his big point really is that savings have shot up and in future, much of that money will not be spent, i.e. there will be a higher saving rate going forward. And in order for inflation not to occur, he has to be right. Mm. But on what basis is he making the assertion? He's just making the assertion. Now, be fair to him, Richard. I think that a lot of that is true for people who are rich. Mm. You know, for, you know, if you look at uh, my own expenditure, you know, the stock market's gone up by 30% or whatever. And, uh, you know, my wealth has gone up by uh, that amount. But yeah. how much have I spent? My spending's gone down because yeah. I haven't been allowed to spend any. I haven't been allowed to go on holiday, you know. So he does have a point. But I think the, he generalizes that over the entire economy. And, you know, the, what's different this time is that workers – down on the uh, lower end of the income spectrum have all been given a lot of government largesse which they are will be able to spend yeah uh, that's right and also there's a difference isn't there between um investment profits and cash that is given to you and is sitting in your bank account yes absolutely um so if you look at um, what Americans did with their stimmy checks, well, they actually only spent about 25% of it while it was saved. But, you know, when they're allowed to go on holiday again, and they're allowed to go out to restaurants, I fully expect them to start spending it, frankly. You know, yeah. Their range of things that they could spend on was severely limited. 
Yeah, that's undoubtedly true, isn't it? And also, they paid down debt. Well, going forward, in history, the American consumer has always liked to spend. You know, now they've repaired their balance sheets. Yeah, you can't. Um, you can't really extrapolate what they're going to do in normal circumstances from what they have done in extreme circumstances. Yeah. Um, and CPI currently, global CPI is, um, you know, subdued. But it's picking up. I mean, <laughs> everywhere we look, CPI is picking up, you know, and that's one of the problems with all these charts is they are backward looking. Yeah. Um, and there's um, a 64% correlation between US inflation and global inflation. So it's saying because global inflation is subdued, US inflation will be subdued. Well, you know, already that is breaking down. What is this? Uh, what is the red line, Keith? Red line, US CPI year over year change and blue line world year over year yeah. change. Difficult graph to interpret, I would say. If the US, the does a lot more fiscal stimulus than the rest of the world. You'd expect inflation in the US to pick up relative to the rest of the world. I mean, one does, you know, correlation is not causation. No. Also, there's this issue, isn't there, of um, if you take a, you know, a country such as Zimbabwe that has hyperinflation, it has it because the government policies destroy the value of the currency and, and the, um, the external debt is unrepayable mm. and one of the issues that is not referred to here in, in his analysis is the amount of u.s government debt and the view the market may or may not have on its on its ultimate repayability yes that's also true okay so that's been a quick run through of his arguments now richard and i are just going to quickly summarize those for you and give our opinion. So his first point is US household income is currently heavily dependent on welfare payments. So, um, I mean, that graph that we, we saw earlier showed, I think that something like 35% of US household income came from welfare payments, but that is in the poorest households and the richest households either they receive the benefit and they don't need it or they don't receive it. So what we're really saying here is that um, this household, this welfare payment is residing in a particular sector and not across the board. And there, therefore, you can't an analyze it on the basis of the whole economy. You have to analyze it on the behavior of those poorest households. Keith. Yeah. Um, well, the extrapolation that consumer spending will fall once again when these welfare payments end. I mean, I just completely disagree with that in that, you know, one hand, he's saying that there's been a lot of welfare payments, particularly to the poor who have saved it all. And going forwards, that when um, welfare payments end, I mean, the economy will normalize. They will go back to work. And also, they've then got a load of savings mm. that they can spend. And also, this, as you've talked about, the uh, this really only affects the poorest households because we know the middle classes actually have just got a load of savings. You know, their income has held up and they haven't been able to spend. So mm. I completely disagree with this argument. Du Sorry. Durable goods spending was brought forward during lockdown? Well, it was. It was, yeah. But we don't. The thing is, again, we don't know how much durable goods spending people want to do. I suspect they really want to do quite a lot, actually. Just mm. looking at my own house, yeah. and you know, they spent on it because there's nothing else to spend on. Now, going forward, we just don't know how much of a desire there is for future durable goods spending. Undoubtedly, it will come down from these, these astronomical highs, but it might just return to normal levels, not yeah. collapse. Yeah, particularly take durable goods, uh, goods manufactured, let's say China, very dependent on what's happening to Chinese wage rates. Yes. And he doesn't discuss that in, in his slide deck, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and that is a factor that would significantly influence prices of imported goods. 
to be fair, he did include, you know, talk about globalization, but um, I think actually that's kind of a separate argument. That's a big, you know, macro argument about the future of the world economy. Yeah. That is not really specific to this. So I kind of cut that out. Fair, fair comment, Keith. Luxury goods inflation surged during lockdown and is unsustainable? Well, it certainly surged. But, I mean, my the thing about luxury good in, inflation is that people spend on luxuries because they these are positional goods mm. and people buy them to maintain their position in society. As you put it earlier, Richard, keeping up with the Joneses. Yes. And as I put it, these are Veblen goods. <laughs> so Veblen, Torsten Veblen was the... Um, economist who discussed these positional goods and how they were not subject to the new normal price demand curve so as the price rose demand for them did not fall in fact it could go up because you know you don't buy a range rover because it's a nice car you buy it because it looks good nice and shiny on your drive and all the neighbors think you're rich and actually, if everyone else has now has a Range Rover, yeah. you're going to have to upgrade to a an Aston Martin or something. So it's not clear to me that because everyone's been spending on luxury goods, the luxury good demand in the future will decline. It may actually be go up. I think speaking of cars, Keith, there's also this issue, and it doesn't just apply to cars, of the, of the global shortage of semiconductors. Now, whilst you know, over the next probably two years or so, that will slowly rectify itself as production capacity increases. What it means at the moment is that there is a shortage of goods that require semiconductors in them, such as motor vehicles, and that will force the prices up, yeah. undoubtedly. So if you, certain categories of luxury goods inflation probably won't fall back because for other reasons, due to damaged supply chains and increasing demand as a result of COVID. Mm. It's just a, yep. just a little bit simplistic, the analysis. Well, it's the, this whole analysis to me, honestly, seems like searching for reasons. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, the, the other thing is luxury goods, luxury goods expenditure is a very, very small proportion of total expenditure. Yeah, yeah. yes, true. So we have a, there is a, only a weak correlation between commodity price inflation and CPI. Well, yes, because food, yes, as we've discussed with uh, food not being increased, not being included in CPI. The, the statement that commodity price inflation will not cause general inflation, depends how much commodity price inflation there is and which commodities they are. Yes, no, absolutely. In particular, we worry about food. Yeah. When, um, when food price inflation picks up, particularly in poor countries, you will see wage inflation. And if um, you get wage inflation in, let's say, China, because pork prices have gone up 50 percent, which they have, then your import prices, import prices go up as well. And we and get so in, exactly. And then we get into the macroeconomic discussion you talked yes. about just a few minutes ago, Keith. And that is a serious factor that needs to be considered within the ambit of one's con conclusions about where inflation is going. Whatever your viewpoints are, you can't dismiss it. So Chinese credit growth is declining? Yes. yes. Commodity price inflation will subside? Well, as we've discussed. Yeah. On which commodity? Yeah, possibly. We don't know, actually. And in the case of copper and oil, I would uh, strongly disagree with that. Mm with there's the bottom line is over the last decade we have not been investing and now consumers have all got money in their pockets and they want to spend on goods and we are investing in the clean tech transition then essentially we're, there's a big demand for commodities and we haven't invested in capacity yes u.s unemployment remains elevated we agree um yeah. The issue I think we have is um, what are the skill short? There are certainly skill shortages. What is the effect of those on uh, costs, input costs? 
but also you know this argument is that if, uh, unemployment is elevated yes it is now but it's coming down very quickly and it's forecast to actually get back to zero by the end of the year so yes. this argument disappears by the end of this year yes bank lending remains depressed well it we agree um and the uh, although it appears as we discussed it appears that it might be becoming less depressed and um of course once the economy normalizes as Keith said what bank would lend in the middle of a pandemic in fact what business would ask to be lent to in the middle of a pandemic when they've got government grants that they can go to um so the it, it, it's not really comparing like with like bank lending in the middle of a pandemic isn't the same as normal bank lending yeah so i think we have to wait to see what happens to bank lending when lockdowns are over when the vaccination programs are completed and when businesses go back to working as and societies go back to working as normal exactly i think this is a huge assumption he's making yeah because all, the cost of money depends on um banks bank lending you know banks are responsible for money creation in a capitalist economy yeah. and he said essentially in order for the velocity of money to keep on declining which it needs to do to offset qe you need the banks to basically just not lend anymore to re reduce their loan books and i can't see it and the other, the other point i think is if the banks don't lend then then debt starts to be repaid and repayment of debt is a reduction in gdp the Fed, U.S. Federal Reserve and any government doesn't want to see a reduction in GDP because that is a recession. So in some way, governments will step in to fill the gap. Americans saved most of their stimulus checks. Yes, we agree. They will continue to save that money. <laughs> tell us the marshmallow test. Yeah, well, you know, the marshmallow test is a very famous test where you get um, put some kids in front of a marshmallow and say you can eat it now or if you wait 20 minutes without eating it then we'll give you two marshmallows and this actually turns out to be an incredibly good indicator of future success in life in that kids who have the self-control to wait 20 minutes and get the the um two marshmallows do very much better in life but about 45 percent of the population fail this test <laughs> and you've got they've got no hope you know any money that goes to them they will spend, will spend. and yeah. you know you think that's going to change going forward uh, you know the key point really is we believe that the post-covid recovery is going to be different from the post um gfc great financial crisis recovery where after the great financial crisis, there was enormous amounts of QE, but there was no inflation. Rich, do you want to talk through this? Well, yes, I mean, thank you, Keith. The QE, effectively, when QE was initiated, a lot of people, myself included, I have to admit, thought it was going to result in inflation uh, as, a, as, a, as a type of money printing. But of course, what actually happened, and you can see this with the benefit of hindsight, is that the QE stayed within the financial system. It stayed as bank reserves and as reserves with uh, the central banks. And it did uh, push up the prices of financial asset, assets. And we've seen that sort of um, unerring increase in stock markets uh, over the last uh, years since the great financial crisis. But very little of it got into the real economy and it didn't go to people who could actually spend the money on goods and services. Whereas during the COVID crisis, the stimulus has been given to consumers, people who are uh, temporarily unemployed and so forth. And as we have here, the poorest members of society. So the big difference is that this um, government expenditure is now available to be spent within the economy by everybody who has received it. Whereas with the initial QE after the GFC, the money was not available to be spent in the economy. And our argument is that many of the people who have received it will spend it. 
and that as they spend it, it will push, put uh, a sort of demand pull pressure into the economy and cause an inflationary uh, uh, an inflationary trend. And I think that I also think that bank lending will increase because banks, after all, make their money out of lending. And if you have bank lending increasing and this money going into the economy, then you really would have a, a lot of money coming into the economy that, it, that is waiting to be spent. Keith, what That's do you think? Um, I'll make a couple of points, actually. First of all, um, post-GFC, I was also very concerned about um, money printing and how that could lead to inflation. Until I, But I did a lot of research, and I read a book, which I recommend everyone to read, called The Holy Grail of Macroeconomics by Richard Koo, which talked about Japan's lost decade and how they had printed vast amounts of money and got no inflation. And his point was that balance sheets sheets were stretched, corporate gap balance sheets were stretched, and corporations prioritized repairing their balance sheet. So it didn't matter how low interest rates went, nobody wanted to borrow money. They wanted to repay debt. And when I understood that, I realized that QE was not actually going to create inflation. And at one stage, I had 70% of my uh, portfolio in the UK 2060 gilt on the basis that I expected interest rates to start falling. And I was right. Yeah, well done. Um, so that was one of my uh, more better trades, actually. Mm. Uh, but above all, you know, the, the point is that this time stimulus has gone to people with a high marginal propensity to spend. Although the rich have a very low marginal propensity to spend. They save most of their wealth because they don't need, need it anything. Yeah. Whereas, you know, poor people do need stuff. And we, we also have um, the situation of the, these large uh, programs that are being discussed, large infrastructure programs and so forth, which all puts money into, quote, the real economy. And it doesn't stay, that money will not stay within the financial system. And so, again, it put, puts pressure on the existing supply chains. OK, so in conclusion, there currently he has, there's no question that deflationary forces remain currently. Yeah. So... You know, unemployment is elevated. Banks are still not lending. But, I mean, our point really is that in order for you not to believe inflation is going to recur, you have to believe that those deflationary forces are going to be maintained as the economy opens up. But consumers have got savings. The poorest members of society now have money which they didn't have beforehand and a propensity to spend banks have repaired their balance sheets corporations actually have paid down debt and interest rates are very very low yeah so all the elements are in place for return of inflation now we don't know as yet how strong the inflationary impulse will be but it seems to me to be making a very big in assumption that there will be no inflationary um, impulse. And, which... uh, yes, um, I agree with all those points, Keith. I also think that the um, one other thing we should factor into this is that I'm not sure that you can use the yield curve as an inflation predictor at the moment, because central banks and governments have an interest in maintaining low interest rates. Yes. And to, to use it as an indicator, I think, is is dangerous um, because we don't really know if it's reflecting the market's view or if it's reflecting um, interference by central banks. Absolutely, good point. And I would also say that I find it extraordinary that as inflation is picking up really quite quickly now and employment and the economy are both picking up that central banks are still keeping interest rates at essentially zero yeah. and doing loads of QE. Yeah. And no sign of that ending. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, 
Rich and I don't buy it, frankly. I think it's fair to say, Richard. Yeah, I think uh, it, there is a great deal of uncertainty. I think David Rosenberg was quite definitive in his view there was not going to be inflation. Uh, my view is that I think there certainly will be inflation over the coming months. The question for me that is unanswered is, will it persist? And I certainly wouldn't say it won't persist. I think it's very difficult to be determined and that you need to have, be positioned for sort of both, both eventualities, really. Well, I think the risks are clearly to the upside, yep. essentially. And, you know, we always advocate not taking too much of a bet and just reacting as circumstances change. And this would yeah. be a very good example of something where don't be too prescriptive, wait and see what happens. Yeah, definitely. Don't know. I, I would agree with that, Keith. Okay, thank you all for watching. Um, I hope you will press like and subscribe to the channel. In the meantime, it's goodbye from Richard Guita. And it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. goodbye. Full disclaimer. The material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.